morning, church. Stay on your feet, all locations. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here today. Man, I am excited to preach the Word of God today. Man, whenever we open the Bible, you got to know that it's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing between bone and marrow, soul and spirit. I believe that the Word of God is living. It's not just my good ideas, but whenever we open the Word of God, we open up to the possibility of God creating something new in our life. How did he create the world? He spoke. So I know that one word from God, you can find anything that you need. So here's what I want us to do wherever you're watching from. As we stand together, I want us to open the word of God. I have, I have a paper Bible if you have one of those, shout out to you. If, if not, no worries. We're going to have the Bible up on the screen. But we've been in a series, Seeking God, and our theme verse is found in Jeremiah 29. 11. So if you have your Bible, open up to Jeremiah 29, 11. You've probably seen it on people's Instagram bios. Shout out to that. Probably seen it on someone's tattoo. Jeremiah 29, 11. Man, you don't even have to be a Christian to get that tattoo. That's where we find ourselves today. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Across all of our campuses, Napa, East Bay, Roseville, here in Vacaville, can we read that all together? Verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Can I pray over you? Jesus, we thank you for your word. And God, we thank you that you want to be found by us. And God, I pray today that every single person here, whether they're in the room or watching at home, that they would experience you afresh and anew today. God, we say, here we are. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. You could take your seat. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad I'm sitting next to you this morning. You know, one of my favorite games when I was a little kid was playing hide and seek. Has anyone ever played hide and seek? It's, it's a classic game. Love hide and seek. If you've never played it before, you got to start living. Go play hide and seek after church today. I remember this one time we were, I was probably you know, four years old, and me and my little brothers were playing with my dad, and so what we did, my dad went off and hid, we counted, and we were going to go out and find my dad, and so we counted, we went off searching for him, we could not find him anywhere, because parents are better at hiding than kids, <laughs> and he was hiding really good, so we're looking everywhere, and all of a sudden, we hear, boys, I'm over here, we stop. We run to where we heard that voice. It sounded like it was coming from their bedroom. We looked everywhere in the bedroom. We could not find him. So we go off looking again. We hear it again. Boys, I'm over here. That time it sounded like it was coming from their bathroom in the bedroom. So we ran into their bathroom. We looked everywhere. We're looking under the toilet seat, under the cabinet. <laughs> We're little kids. Couldn't find him anywhere. So we run out. And I decide, you know what? I'm just going to stand right here at the doorway. Waited for a little bit. And all of a sudden, I see the window over the shower. I see my dad's head poke in. He says, boys, I'm over here. I run in. I say, I found you. I start laughing. My brother John runs in. He starts laughing. My dad's excited. There's nothing like the moment where you get found, especially if you are a parent playing with your kids. You want to get found because there's so much joy, there's so much excitement. The reason my dad was calling out to us was because he wanted to be found by us. That's what seeking God is all about. Think about that. The creator of the universe, your father in heaven, is not hiding from you to keep himself from you, but he's hiding so that he can be found. Because that moment when you find him, when you seek for him, when you search for him, when you have that moment, there's nothing better in the world because that's what you were created for because finding him is about intimacy nearness and closeness that we get to be with our father and in being with him in finding him you find who you truly are because who you truly are was created to be with God if you feel lost all you need to do is find your creator who's calling you by name that's what seeking God 
is all about. God is inviting us into a life of seeking, which is a life of relationship. It's not about seeking a location. It's not about seeking a feeling or an emotion. It's about seeking a person. And that person is Jesus. I love when Jesus calls his disciples. What does he say? He says, follow me. But Jesus, where are we going to sleep? Follow me. Where where are we going to eat? Follow me. Where are we going? Follow me. Just follow me. He invites us as disciples into a life of seeking. That's what he's saying. Seek me. Just, Just follow me. Here's the thing. We do not follow Jesus so that we can get to where we want to go. We follow Jesus wherever he takes us. I'm going to say that again. We do not follow Jesus to get to where we want to go. We follow Jesus wherever he takes us. God, I give you everything. That, that's seeking with all of our heart. God, I give you everything. This is what you were created for. But I want to let you know this. To be a seeker, you do not have to be perfect. All of us are broken. All of us have failed. All of us have messed up. You see, seeking God is not up and to the right. No, no, it looks more like this. There are high moments. There are peaks. But also in this seeking, following relationship, there are low moments. There are moments when you make a mistake. There are moments when you're not living to the life that God has called you to live. We have all been in those moments. We've all had moments of failure. How do you seek in those low moments? How do you seek when you've made the biggest mistake of your life? How do you seek through failure? Because if we're honest, we've all been there. In fact, the context that Jeremiah 29 is written is written within the context of failure. The people of God had turned their back on him. Instead of following his covenants, instead of following his commands, instead of pursuing him as God and God alone, They were in his promise land, but even in the promised land, they turned their back on him. They began to trust in themselves instead of trusting in God. They would go to the temple and worship him, but then leave and start worshiping other pagan gods, even to the point of sacrificing their own children to these demonic pagan gods. They had completely rejected the one who wanted to be in relationship with them, who was seeking after them. And because they rejected him, God allowed them to go into exile. So they were taken from the promised land. And in Jeremiah 29, 11, this is a letter that Jeremiah writes to the children of Israel who are in exile in Babylon. They were taken captive. Taken from the place that was the promise. The place that was theirs. They were taken from that and they found themselves enslaved. Why? Because they turned their back on God. They had failed. They had messed up. All hope had seemed like it was lost. We can all relate to the children of Israel in Jeremiah 29. We've all been there before. We've all made mistakes. We've all let God down it from time to time. No one is perfect. No, not one of us. They'd made the biggest mistake of their life. And it was at that moment they realized, man, it seems like all hope is lost. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you're there right now. Maybe this week, and something happened at work, and you're like, it's over. It's done. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Maybe this week, instead of telling the truth, you told a lie. And that lie, you've just been carrying that. You feel that pain. Maybe it's your marriage right now, and you feel like, man, we're just hanging on by a thread I don't know how we're going to get through this. Maybe you find yourself caught in a cycle of addiction that you hate so much, but you just can't break. Maybe you were sober for a long time, and and this week you relapsed, and you feel like, man, what am I even doing? I'm such a failure. You're not alone. That's where the children of Israel were. Let me say this. If that's you right now, you're in the right place. Way to be in church, way to be in the house. You're doing better than you think. But here's what I want to let you know. You can still seek even in the midst of your failure. 
And so what I want to do is I want to look at three points from Jeremiah 29 that show us how we can seek even when we're at our lowest. How we can keep chasing after God even when we're at our most broken, even when we failed and it seems like all hope is lost. I want to look at three things. The first is this. Know that it's not over. Know that it's not over. They found themselves in exile, which, would, which was going to last for 70 years. Know this. We all fail. It's not over. Consequences are real, though. They were facing those consequences. They were living out the reality of those consequences. But see what God says to them in Jeremiah 29, 11. He doesn't say, told you so, because they had plenty of warning. It wasn't just one mistake. It was generation after generation after generation where he said, come back to me. Come back to me. Stop worshiping other gods. Stop sacrificing to other gods. Come back to me. He didn't say, told you so. He didn't say, you get what you deserve. What did he say? He said, I have a plan for you. I have a plan for you. What is God saying? This is not the end. You might feel like all hope is lost. You might have given up. You might feel like you're a failure. But what God says over your life is I have a plan for your life. Know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans of welfare and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. Even when you're at your lowest, God wants to let you know it's not over. There's hope. You don't have to stay where you're at. Yes, the mistake is real. Yes, the hurt and the pain is real. And even the consequences are real. But God has not given up on you. Even when you turn your back on God, he says over your life, I have a plan for you. I have a plan for you. And I always tell my kids, when, whenever you're in a scary situation, the worst thing you can do is freak out. The worst thing, you, it's only going to make it worse. Don't freak out. We were at my parents' house over Christmas, and they live on the beach. And on Christmas Day, we were just hanging out on the beach with the family. Our kids are in their PJs. Jack's a seven-year-old. Him and Lucy, they love the water. They're like, can we just put our feet in? I'm like, okay, you can put your feet in. So they're putting their feet in. I'm there. My brother John's there. His wife's there. And uh, I see this guy who's doing some work on his house. And I'm at the age right now where... I like to talk to people who are doing work on their house. Maybe it's because I turned 35 this year. It's something I'm into. It used to not be the case. And I said, hey, John, Natalie, can you watch the kids while they're just playing in their ankles, you know? I'm going to go talk to this guy. They're responsible adults. All good. So I'm going up there and talk, talk to him. Well, Jack's a seven-year-old. You know seven-year-olds are always going to push the limit. He's in his full PJs. Somehow he went from his ankles. I'm talking to this guy. And I look. And I see a little head floating out to sea. And I see another person running after them. And I yell to Natalie, is that John and Jack? And she says, yes, in that moment, I go full lifeguard mode. I'm sprinting towards the water, take off my shirt. What happened was Jack pushed it a little bit, got deeper, deeper, a wave came. Within seconds, a riptide had pulled him like 20 yards out to sea. Thank God my brother John just dove in full clothes. He got to him before I could. Brings Jack in. He's freezing cold in his PJs. My, and my brother John's like, man, it was amazing. Jack was out there just laying on his back. <laughs> just saying, help. But when John got to him, perfectly calm. <laughs> Not freaking out. I think I told him enough in his life, hey, when you're in a dangerous situation, the worst thing you can do is freak out. You rehearse something enough, you begin to believe it. Right now, some of you rehearsing over in your mind, it's over, it's done, I failed, I messed up, it's too late, I messed up on the promises of God. That's not what you should be rehearsing. You need to rehearse Jeremiah 29, 11. God has a plan for my life. He has a hope for my life. He wants to bring good things. He wants to prosper me. That's what you need to be rehearsing. It's not over. Second thing that we see in Jeremiah 29 is when you fail, ask for help. He says, pray to me, talk to me, and I will hear you. Prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. What do you do when you fail? Do you medicate? Do you zone out? Do you just turn on Netflix, binge watch? 
do you isolate yourself, our first response should be to go to the creator of the universe and tell him where we're at. See, prayer is inviting God into our brokenness. When we pray, we're simply having a conversation with God, an honest conversation. God, here's where I'm at. God, I need your help. I need your help. I've been, I've been married 10 years, almost 10 years, 10 years in May, which is awesome. Guys, can we give it up for Sierra? <laughs> because she's been married to me for almost 10 years. I am so stubborn. I am so hard-headed. And I'm sure it's not easy <laughs> to stay married to me. Um, if you can identify with me, you know, we need some prayer. Um, but, but believe it or not, yes, I'm a pastor. Yes, I'm speaking on this stage. But there are times when me and Sierra get into arguments. Whoa, pastor, really? Come on, none of us are perfect. There are times we disagree, we get into arguments. And, and last week I was just being stubborn like I am. And we were disagreeing on something and I, was being, I wasn't changing my mind. And, 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 you know, I've learned in the last nine and a half years, 95% of the time, it's my fault and I am in the wrong, 100% honest. Yeah. I wish I could learn that quicker before I drag it on like I do, but I'm stubborn, I'm slow to learn. And so me and Sierra, we were disagreeing on something. We decided to go on a walk separately. And so... <laughs> so we're walking, I'm walking, she's walking, opposite directions. And <laughs> what I did in that moment is... At first, I was thinking about all the reasons I was frustrated and why I was right. But then what that turned into is, man, God, I need your help. I love Sierra. She's the best thing that's ever happened to me. God, I don't want to be a jerk. I don't want to be stubborn. I don't want there to be anything in between us. God, would you find that? And God, would you remove that? I need you. And as I begin to pray, Something supernatural begins to happen to your soul. When you pray, it brings a refreshing to your soul. It gives you a fresh perspective, and it brings healing to your life. Me and Sierra still aren't talking, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we love each other. We made it right. We're doing good. Just joking. Love you, Sierra. Hey, but I want to encourage you, pray first, pray first, go and pray, talk to Jesus, why? He's listening, it's not just positive affirmation, we're not just speaking to the universe, no, we have a God who's in relationship with us, who's listening, he said, I will hear you, the greatest thing you can do when you failed, ask for help, admit that you cannot do it on your own, and that you need a higher power. I need help. I need help is the most powerful thing you could say. I need help. Go to God first and let me add this. Then go ask somebody in the church for help. That's why you need to be in a group. Find a leader. Find a pastor. Because here's what the enemy loves to do. Right when you fail, he will want to isolate you. He'll want to say, hey, you need to go off and fix yourself and then come back into the community. That is the greatest lie of the enemy. You see it so often. Why weren't you at church? Oh, man, I just was messing up. Had a hard week. No, that's when you should be in church. That's when you should be in community. I need help. And what you'll find is the loving arms of people who believe in you and a God who created you for something greater. So much grace. So I want to encourage you, ask for help. Third thing that we see in Jeremiah 29 and, and, and something we could take when we failed is this. Get up and start walking. Seek me. And you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. That is an action. He's inviting us into a journey. He's inviting us to create a pathway. That's what seeking, the definition of that is, is to create a pathway. Get up and start walking. Easier, easier said than done. You know, I think one of the beautiful picture of this is, is the story of David, King David. In Acts, God calls him a man after my own heart. That's a title God gives David. David didn't give it himself. God gave that to him. This is a man after my heart. What is he saying? He gets me. That's my guy. The way he lived, the way he conducted his life, 
That's what it looks like to seek me and chase after my, my heart. That's who David was. Know this, David was not perfect. And think about all the bad things you've done. I guarantee you it wasn't as bad as David. <laughs> See, David was king of Israel. All of his armies were off fighting, but he stayed back home. He should have been out there fighting with his men, but he was staying at home. And he was on his castle, and he was looking out, just doing what kings do, I guess. And he saw a lady bathing, Bathsheba. She was on a rooftop. And as the king, he's like, I want her. And so he made it happen. He brought her to the castle. He slept with Bathsheba. Here's the thing you have to know, though. That was someone else's wife. So he committed adultery. And then to cover up his mistake, he had her husband, who was fighting for him on the front lines, he had him put right up in front. And when he was up front, he had the armies back away and had him killed. He murdered him. A man after God's own heart was an adulterer and a murderer. But yet God called him a man after my heart. He wasn't perfect. He made mistakes. But this is what happened. The prophet Nathan, this was, this was David's pastor. He walks into the castle. David's there acting like the king, doing, doing his stuff, not admitting his faults. Everyone's around. Nathan just calls him out straight. He says, you did this, 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 and this, and you sinned against God. Sometimes you need people like that in your life. You, you need some people who are going to call you out when you've made a mistake. You know people truly love you when they do that. So he did it. He called him out. You know what David did in that moment? He fell on his face, weeping, broken, and said, I have sinned against God. Forgive me. He was broken and humble. You see, the enemy loves to define us based off of our failures. But God defines us based off of our response when we fail. You see, failure is an opportunity to grow. It's all based on your response, though. And how do we get up in the kingdom? We have to go down. He humbled himself, broken before God. God can elevate someone who's broken. If you want to know what that looks like, read Psalms 32 and Psalms 51. Pray through those. That's the prayer of God, forgive me. I've sinned against you. I've, trans I've sinned against you. Notice, it's not this. It's not, I'm sorry. We don't teach our kids to say, I'm sorry. It's, it's, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? I sinned. I messed up. Will you forgive me? David was broken. God can use that. A pathway straight to the heart of God is a pathway of humility and brokenness. Do not let your ego get in the way from you getting to the heart of God. See, David was a man after God's own heart, not because he was perfect, but because he responded well in the midst of his failure. So God can elevate that. And God uses that repentance, God uses that brokenness to start creating pathways. See, it says this in Proverbs 25, 16, for the righteous fall seven times, but yet he rises again. You can get up even when you've fallen. I love what it says in Romans 8, 28, that for those who love God, all things work together for their good. I looked up the definition of all in the Greek. It means all. <laughs> I love that joke. I used it last night. I'll use it again. I've heard it my whole life. All things, all things, even your failures, even your mistakes, even your mess ups, all things but how do we see how God works all things together for our good? Because sometimes when you're in the middle of it, we, we don't know how. How you do it is by taking a step forward and looking back. It's the story of Joseph. That which you meant for evil, God turned around for good. How could he see that? Because he had gone long enough on the journey, he could look back at God's providence and see how he had worked all things together for his good. How will God use your failure? The only way you're going to find out is if you take a step forward. If you begin to walk down the path of repentance, brokenness, humility, where you're saying, I'm going to seek God no matter what. I'm going to chase after his heart no matter what. Even if I made mistakes, even if I have to pay the consequences and go through the work and go through the process, I'm going to do it. Why? Because at some point, I'm going to look back and I'm going to see how God used that failure for his good and for his glory. But you got to create a path. 
You have the opportunity right now. What type of path are you creating? Because we can either create paths of humility, repentance. We can create paths of honesty and character. Or we can create paths of lying, secrecy, bitterness, unforgiveness. And here's what you have to know about the paths we create. If you walk along them enough times, those paths will turn into highways. You can drive across Highway 80 over the pass. It can be snowing. You could be in your car with seat heaters and a Starbucks latte cruising on that freeway. But know that that wasn't always a freeway. We all know the story of the Donner Party. It used to be a difficult path. You travel, (laughs) really difficult. But you travel across a path enough, it turns into a highway, not just for you, but for future generations. So the decisions you make right now in your brokenness and your failure, you're actually creating pathways for your children and your children's children to walk down. Some of you were born into families with dysfunctional pathways and highways that were created because of brokenness and failure that was never brought to God and healed. Even look at the children of Israel in Jeremiah 29. They were in captivity for 70 years. That means there were those who were born into captivity who never sinned against God but were suffering the consequences of their parents. And whether it's firsthand failure or secondhand pain from someone else's failure, the pain and the hurt is real. But here's what I want to let you know. You have an opportunity right now. You're at a crossroads right now. You can start to create new paths. You can start to build new highways that go straight into the presence of God so that when your kids grow up or your grandkids grow up, that they can walk freely into the presence of God and they don't have to experience the pain and the hurt that you grew up with because you chose to take a different path. Humble yourself. Repent. And God's welcoming you with open arms. Don't quit. Ask for help and get up and keep walking. Keep seeking. Man, you look back at Genesis, the beginning of everything. Adam and Eve are in perfect relationship with God in the garden, doing what they were created to do. But then they disobey God. They sinned against God. They turn their back on God. The moment they sin, what is the first thing they do? It says they hid themselves, they realized they were naked, and they sewed leaves together to try to cover their nakedness. Man, isn't that what we do when we make mistakes, when we sin against God? We try to hide ourselves. We separate ourselves from the thing we were created for. That's such a lie of the enemy. Shame and guilt are a liar trying to keep you from the thing you were made for, being in relationship with God. They hid themselves. Then they tried to cover themselves. That's like when my kids spill something and they try to clean it up, they only make it worse. Just getting chocolate milk everywhere. Lucy spills her chocolate milk every morning. Pray for her. They try to cover themselves. Really, guys? You think that's gonna work? Fig leaves? You think we can't tell? Like... You messed up, but that's what we do. We think if we cover ourselves and put off the appearance that we're good enough and we can, we, can, we can cover our sin and our failure, that over a period of time, then we can talk about it and then we can walk in healing, that couldn't be further from the truth. One of the lowest moments in all of humanity, Adam and Eve sin, they're hiding themselves, they try to cover themselves. What does God do? This is actually the first instance of someone seeking anyone in the Bible. God is walking in the garden and he says this, Genesis 3, 9, he says, but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? At their lowest moment, at the moment of greatest shame where sin entered humanity, what is God doing? He's seeking after them. He's looking for them. He's saying, where are you? Where are you? Why? Because even when you're at your lowest, God is still seeking and chasing after you. He did it for Adam and Eve. He did it for the children of Israel in Jeremiah 29. Jesus did it for me and you on the cross. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why? So that he could seek and save those who were lost. 
God's seeking you out. He's calling you by name. And the same thing he said to Adam and Eve is the same question he's asking us today. Where are you? Where are you? He knows where you are. But he's wanting you to admit where you are. Because honesty is the only way to get to his heart. This is one of the scariest things you could do. It says, we will find him and we seek him with all of our heart. All of our heart, not just the good parts of our heart. The darkness, the sin, the filth, the failure. He wants all of it. And he's asking you today, where are you? Are you willing to face your failure square in the eyes? Look at it. Say, God, I give it to you. Here, here's where I am. I can't do this on my own. I'm tired of living this way. God, here I am. Because God cannot heal that which is hidden. He can only heal that which you willingly give him. It's a partnership that's seeking. He's, he initiated, but he's looking for you. He wants you. And he's asking you today, where are you? And here's what I know. When you thought all hope was lost and you've given up everything, I believe God wants to restore it back to you, that which was lost. He's a God of healing and restoration. How do I know that? We go back to Jeremiah 29, verse 13. It says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Let's go to verse 14. I will be found by you. I will be found by you. He's not dangling carrots. It's going to happen. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore the fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. God wants to restore your life. He wants to restore your mind. He wants to restore your soul. He wants to restore your marriage. He wants to restore your relationships. He wants to restore your relationship with him. He is a God who is seeking and searching after you, chasing after you so that he can bring you back into the place of promise. It's not over, my friend. This is not the end of the story. God wants to restore your life. Campus pastors, you can take it. Here in the room, I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes. Today, when nobody looking around, if you would say, I'm lost, I'm broken, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Today, I wanna to start a relationship with Jesus. I want forgiveness of my sins. God wants to be found by you. Today, if you'd say, you know what, I'm a sinner. I want forgiveness and I want to start a relationship with Jesus. On the count of three, with no one looking around, I want you to raise your hand in the air. One, two, three. If that's you, just raise your hand. Hands all over the place. You're not alone. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Amazing. You could put your hand down. Everyone here in this room, I want us to pray this prayer together. Say, Jesus. A little bit louder. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I ask that you would forgive me. I believe you died on the cross, and I believe you rose again. And today, I commit to following you all the days of my life, even when I fail, until I see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Can we get up for every person who prayed that prayer? I want to encourage you, if you prayed that prayer, you'll notice as you leave, there are people holding these yellow cards. Grab one of these, head to the Connect area. We would love to put a Bible in your hand, answer any questions that you might have, and help you on this journey. Hey, we ended a little bit early. We're going to worship. I want to encourage you, don't bolt for the doors. What I want us to do is I want us all to stand to our feet. I'm going to pray over us one more time, and then we're going to open up these altars. Here's what I believe, every person here. None of us are perfect, all of us have made mistakes. You're at a crossroads right now, just like David was. You can either continue to go down a path of destruction or you can go down the path towards God's heart. Some of you need to repent 
Some of you need to get broken before God and say, God, here's all of me. Seek me with all of your heart. May be big, it may be small. Doesn't matter what anyone thinks. Like I said, we've all made mistakes. But now is your moment. It's not over. Ask for help and get up and start walking. So Jesus, I pray for every person here. God, I speak against shame and lies. No more. Break it off right now. This is not the end of their story. God, I pray right now today would be a moment to start a new way of living. God, that they would begin to walk down the path of repentance and brokenness, even if it's difficult. God, that you would give them the courage to go through the process. You would give them the courage to completely surrender. And God, I pray right now your Holy Spirit would begin to restore, begin to heal, begin to bring breakthrough, and begin to give hope again. Some of you have been living without hope. God, I pray for hope right now in the name of Jesus. Amen.